Greetings, everyone. This is Rock and Roll Spot Country with the Wicked Comic Grana. Uh, we've got ourselves a decently sized haul this week, uh, even with the weather. Uh, but anyway, let's get started, shall we? Kicking things off, we've got Sabretooth, number one. So, uh, catching up with Sabretooth. Last time we saw Sabretooth, he was being, uh, he was sentenced to what's referred to in, in Krakoa as the pit for violating the first law. Namely, kill no, the first law, kill, kill no man. As, um, there were fatalities caused by him during the uh, mission he undertook with uh, Toad and Mystique during, I want to say it was House of X number one. Anyway, um, so, Sabretooth is uh, sentenced to the pit with the bowels of uh, Krakoa. Um, we get a slight write up as to what the pit is. I'm not sure who it's. I'm not really sure who who it's by. I'm trying to find at least something, but yeah, no. Anyway, so while he's been in the pit, he's imagined scenarios where he escapes, and basically just gets to do what he does best: kill. You see him killing a bear. Um, the X-Men show up and he fights them off, ripping uh, Cyclops' face off, or at least from like here, like here up, and using him as, using his, uh, using the fact that his eyes are, can't close now as a means of making Cyclops a weapon, which he uses to kill Jean, Logan, uh, and Storm. Nightcrawler manages to avoid him, but and makes it and tries to kill him, but he's got to get in close and well, so Saber just bites him and he's got to kill him. But the way that Nightcrawler appeared, he did so with his hand stuck in uh, Saber's chest around his heart, so Kree grips that out. It grows back though. Find himself in prison, though, in in jail, and uh, it's hurt. And uh, Doug Ramsey, DA, comes to see him. Turns out that, but yeah, you know, basically, kind of trying to you know, give him a deal. It's funny he represents the state. Saber, who's quickly realized. Or, learns that he's not actually there when he rips Doug's head off, and Doug is still talking. But he asked a really very important question. Okay, so you escaped. How did you escape? And Tim Booth realizes he can't remember. But it's explaining, you know, it's because he didn't. He's still there. Just imagine everything he's done is something he's imagined. And he's explaining, he's trying to, he's trying to change what the pit could be. That you know, not so maybe not so much alive but immobile, aware but unable to act upon it. And he, but he basically has a plea deal, so to speak, for uh, Sabretooth, and so Sabretooth reads through it, signs it, and uh, yeah, more. Fantasy's going after everyone he want he ever wants to kill. Quiet Council. Um, it, it, when he says he catches up with some old acquaintances, uh, the panel shows him having ripped Iron Fist's uh, hands off. Bear in mind that Saber first appeared in an issue of Iron Fist back in the 70s, Iron Fist number 14. Quite likely the most valuable single issue of any Iron Fist series. 
kind of amusing when you think about it, as well as uh, all of the other uh, feral mutants, wild child, uh, feral, wolverine, so on, wolf's bane, so on and so forth. But after a while, it's like, you know, but he explained a funny thing happened. After he killed every enemy, after he tore out the guts of every living thing that ever hurt him, he attempted to consider what came next, to wonder what he could be when he wasn't the lackey or the heel or the paid assassin. And same as he always paid, prided himself on knowing what he was. Was that true? Maybe he never got to imagine what, what else he could be. And so... the Council of Creed meets. The, the Feral Council. The boy, the beast, and the more suit and tie version of uh, Sabretooth. Think about all the, all the kills they had. And, um, so, Creed became king of mutant hell. Traveled the feral lands with an unbreakable blade, Bright Fury. Sl slew both beast and man. And where he went, he left the mark of Creed, which is a kind of... Then there's another fantasy he has of being leader of the Starjammers. where they took down the Akanti, the Shi'ar, the Centaurians, and the, and the Chimeleons. So basically, they were the CIA, but in outer space. But, uh... Black Tom started to notice Sabretooth... Um... Oh... Images of Sabretooth appearing and the trees in Krakoa. It's an odd thing. One of them even seems to have the mark of Creed on him. Others are seeing images of him. Some pass it off as a trick of the eye, a flash of, a flash of light in a dark corner. Others assume it's simply a, a nightmare. After all, Saber has started more than a few. But, uh, basically he had, he made a Krakow in hell, with him, with him on the throne. The image of Krakow in hell shows demons, uh, slaughtering the members of the Quiet Council. But then something happened, something new. Five more people joined him. Necra, Madison Jeffries, Oya, Melter, and Third Eye. Uh, I honestly have no idea why any of them are being sent to the pit. And so, Sabretooth basically says he's going to practice uh, being, the, being, well, the king of hell on him. And once he gets real good at putting them through hell, you do the same to every mutant on Krakoa. And that is where the issue ends. One of the, I guess, I, this issue really kind of drove home exactly what it is I like about Sabretooth as a villain. Uh, okay, so, the villains that are sympathetic, they're, they're great. You know, it's a great, it's a great storytelling concept. I, I'm, all, I'm a fan of it. I'm, I'm all for it. But equally great are the irrepentant villains. The villains who are evil just because... Why not? Like, sure, they know they were put through, they were put through a trauma that, that you know, kind of clicked that, that 
tick that box in their head to say, yeah, slaughter everyone, everyone that you want. They know that, and they know they could probably even get someone to work, they could probably find someone to help them work through that trauma. But they don't want to. Not because, not, not, it's just, you know, it's because they finally found something they enjoy. Uh, the Joker makes that list, I would say. Uh, Bullseye, Sabretooth. You know, these are, these are villains that, you know, that are thoroughly evil. Now, to be fair, Sabretooth has had his face turns. Uh, most recently in the uh, Weapon X series that ran concurrent with uh, X-Men Blue and X-Men Gold. But, and in the, and in, in the, even during the 1990s when he was part of, when he helped the X-Men during the Phalanx Covenant. He's had his hero moments, but they never stick. And so it, it's, it's kind of nice to see someone just say, yeah, Sam Cruz is an evil bastard. Thoroughly. Anyway, moving on to our next book, we've got Ten Lives of Wolverine, number two. We've also got ourselves a nifty, nifty variant cover. I was quite fond of this. Uh, I've always been a fan of uh, the Team X look for Wolverine, as well as, in all honesty, Maverick and Sabretooth. Uh, and I've also been a, a fan of Mark Bagley's artwork. And Well, when you get Mark Bagley doing the, uh, the Team X Wolverine look, yeah, okay, I'm sold. Anyway. So let's get on to the actual issue, though. Um, where we had left off, Wolverine had uh, prevented Omega Red from a mentally time traveling Omega Red from killing Xavier as, or from preventing Xavier's birth. Uh, and we had learned that Omega Red had found had learned the truth about. Uh, what changes had been made to his carbonadium synthesizer. And it had gone to Moscow and seemed to be working for Mikhail Rasputin. So the issue begins in the year 1900 in northern Canada. Um, Wolverine is in a... Logan's in a pit fighting a bear when his modern consciousness uh, basically enters his, old, his younger body. He throws one of the spectators of the bear fight into the pit and, is, and makes his and leaves with Gene basically uh, Gene kind of saying, "Hey, you have, kind of have to be careful about you know making any changes. You know, we don't know the impact it, it could have." But Wolverine was like, "Hey, tell that to the bear." Um, the next uh, time period he's in is um, with. Itsu, his Japanese wife, which even includes a recreation of a uh, famous, I want to say, if I remember if it was a Rolling Stone cover, or it's a famous photograph of uh, John Lennon and Yoko Ono. The two of them lying in bed naked, naked together, John pretty much kind of wrapped, wrapped around Yoko. But she's been possessed by Omega Red. Also, invading in, in the moment is Gene, just basically kind of <clears throat> Now we pick up, however, with a story, where, where issue one left off years ago in Colombia on a team on a team X mission. They're going after a uh, Coke lab, but Logan has been assigned to prevent Omega Red from killing Xavier again. But uh, Logan tells Gene that. If there's one period, if there's one period of his life he absolutely despises, it's the time he was with Team X because you know he just went where they sent him, killed who they told him to kill. Even remembering that after that particular mission, they killed everyone in the surround, they slaughtered all the surrounding villages. The idea being, fear America more than you fear the cartel. So. 
And then we get another flashback um, with apparently explaining that Omega Red was a part, uh, was being auditioned for X Force with Domino and Wolverine. They go to a bathhouse hoping to speak to. Uh, Or so be, it was the intention of interrogating Maxim. But Maxim isn't there. However, uh, Omega Red is, uh, has the, uh, the surveillance portion of the uh, carbonium synthesizer turned off by Mikhail. And basically, hey, look, you know, look into what you what's been done to you. We get a entry of Sage's logbook about uh, Omega Red's suspected defection, indic indicating that uh, it's quite likely that um, Mikhail Rasputin has been weaponizing information called from the Cerebro Sword. Um, we then pick back up the 1900s portion of things. Um, Xavier's grandfather. Uh, I don't. I'm not sure if it was a whaling ship, but similar. Similar. It was. It was a. Uh, uh, he was the captain of a ship that uh, that uh, at least did uh, hunted sea animals, and one of the men is attacked. Is taken over by Omega Red. Attacks him. Xavier tosses him over the side, but it spreads to one of the others, and yeah, a mutiny begins, and while well, Wolverine's on his way to prevent Xavier's grandfather from being killed. Back in Colombia, um, Wolverine shoots the hell out of Sabretooth, maims Maverick, basically to ensure that, you know, They don't get the, you know, the civilians that they would kill aren't killed. Of course, this uh, pisses off Sabretooth. Um, with Itsu, she uh, attacks him as Omega Red, and is, which was, of course, very hard because now Wolverine's got to figure out how to, you know, how to stop her without killing her, especially since at this point she is pregnant with Dakin, his Wolverine's son. And the issue ends with him slashing at her throat, or at least at her, definitely drawing blood. An interesting tale. It'll be, it'll be interesting to see where uh, the pick up there with Itsu. Um, I doubt they're going to use other means of killing off uh, Dakin. It seems Dakin does have his following. Why, I don't know. I mean, hey, I mean, yeah, okay, lately he's been a bit more palatable, but before, yeah. Anyway, moving on to our next book, we've got X-Men Legends number 11. So this takes place, um, I want to say, after the events of Mutant Massacre. We get a definitive point of reference, I want to say. Um... Before New Mutants number 77. Um, Ileana has been de-aged, uh, and the intention is to, and the new mutants need mean to take her back to, uh, Russia with her family, to be with her family. Um, Psyche, Psyche, Danny Moonstar, is starting to experience strange headaches, but Apocalypse is looking to rebuild his forces. Two of his horsemen are, he's down two horsemen. Having only war and famine left. Caliban is also there, but not a horseman as of yet. But, um, Caliban suggests maybe they could test some of the Morlocks. You know, maybe they could test some of the surviving Morlocks, see if any of them are worthy of being a horseman. So, the trio go to the, are sent to the Morlock tunnels, while the, uh, New Mutants are... playing in a local arcade. However, the Morlocks run from 
horse, Caliban and the Horsemen, mistaking them for the Marauders, and using one of their various uh, attempts, one of their various uh, tunnels to the surface, which lets out into the arcade that the new mutants are at. But uh, they explain what's going on, and War is using his seismic powers, and which come close to bringing down the tunnels. We get a pre exports feral. Caliban is trying to catch up with the Morlocks himself to say, hey, whoa, 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 we, we don't mean you guys harm. However, War is, well, War, and kind of looking around saying, yeah, we, these are, these mutants are weak. But the new mutants show up, um, And they do manage to save the day. Um, healer heals the new mutants and the and the injured Morlocks, while uh, Caliban is uh, basically told by the other Morlocks that he's he's basically he's become just as bad as the, as the Marauders. Caliban basically says, makes an offer to work with Apocalypse for the to the uh, New Mutants who also pass, and so he returns to uh, to Apocalypse, and Apocalypse decides that for further scouting missions, Caliban will uh, will go on his own. And the uh, the new mutants regroup, and the issue ends with them heading to Russia to return Ileana to her family. And a, a, a good little a good issue. I'm, I'm really kind of, I'm enjoy I'm really enjoying X Men Legends. Um, it's it it's nice little in between stories, which are always fun. Um, sometimes sometimes it shows something that you know we never would have thought about, like. You know, okay. The little side adventure of the New Mutants before they took Ileana Rasputin back to her family. Other times it's something that has no real bearing on anything, like, um... Uh... Number 10 with its little Mutant Illuminati meeting. Moving on to our next book, though, we've got The Excellent Number 1. So the excellent is a uh, it, it, apparently this spins out of a recent Giants I think it was last maybe last year year before it was a giant size ecstatics. Ecstatics was a uh, a brief replacement book for X Force. The ecstatics took over X basically X Force morphed into ecstatics in the mid, in the late nineties. It was a more uh, tongue in cheek meta commentary um, about celebrity culture, but. Um, the Ecstatics are filming a movie which will include them fighting The Excellent. The Excellent are made up of former Ecstatics member uh, Zeitgeist, as well as Uno, a floating eye, Mirror Girl, Hurt John, while The Ecstatics are made up of uh, Mr. Sensitive, Dupe, Fat, P-H-A-T, Fat, Vivis Sector, and V-A, Son of original ecstatic member anarchist, but they're the whole thing is going to revolve around the ecstatics rescuing the daughter of Hugo Girl from uh, the excellent. But they're ad living. The director's not happy. In fact, he's kind of irritated with, with the fact that all these superheroes just love to ad lib. And yeah. Uh, Mainly, be, I would say mainly because this time at least it fell flat. But uh, Zeitgeist puts out a uh, is a live stream. Ends up ha ends up having over over a hundred million social media followers, and shows a uh, Bosch version of the uh, recent fight with the Ecstatics. Uh, but it turns out that Zeitgeist and the Excellent have been popping up at various. Uh, Society functions, uh, 
starting off with a the premiere for a uh, action movie starring uh, Bach Helmsum. Hurt John basically made uh, Fox see all of his, uh, you know, who he, deal with who he really was, you know, deal with his inner pain publicly. And there have been various other happenings, such as a, uh, a hero comic book convention where Mirror Girl showed some of the fans what they really were. Um, the lightweight, he light, light heavyweight championship of the world, where Zeitgeist both knocked out both fighters with one hand tied behind his back, and various others. But uh, now the other running member of the group is uh, Joe Baum, who caused explosions in, in midair. But uh, turns out that the excellent are also trying to rebuild Venus de Milo, but it looks like it's going to take about five years. They they need a teleporter basically. And Zeitgeist tried to recruit you know, recruit others. Nightcrawler, who doesn't buy into Zeitgeist's vision, and so, you know, if he does something, he, he's got to really believe in it. Blink, who is just given the creeps by Zeitgeist. But it turns out that it, what, what uh, Zeitgeist sees in Mirror Girl, it, when he looks at the Mirror Girl's reflection, is or the Mirror Girl's Mirror, is uh, unflattering, though he claims it's very pleasant. But, um, the ecstatics of the new recruit who can uh, form a wall, at courtesy of Dupe. And uh, they go to the... But it turns out that the next happening of the excellent is that a a live hologram tour for deceased British rock legend Rick Rager. Um, the ecstatic show up. Mirror Girl is instructed to uh, basically make sure that the A-listers all look, look into her mirror and that what they see is shown. Uh, but the ecstatic show up, fight breaks out, and Vivisector ends up with a massive uh, hole blasted through his stomach. Uh, one, one, one thing that is made clear is that Part of the appeal of the older uh, ecstatic team was the body count. Char oftentimes, members of the team died. And that's a tradition that it seems that they're keeping that they're keeping up with. Uh, it, it was it's a fun little mini. It, it was a fun first issue. I, I, I'll probably spend the next month trying to figure out if I'm gonna actually keep reading it or not. <sighs> I don't. Know, I just don't know. But uh, anyway, moving on to our next book, we've got. Star Wars Crimson Rain, number two. Where we left off, uh, Crimson Lady Kira and Crimson Dawn had basically started a massive war of crime syndicates in the Star Wars universe, seemingly all vying for the Emperor's favor. And her, she was also utilizing her agents to further sow discord. Um, the Knights of Ren are being sent on a mission. Um... Ochi of Bestoon and Destic are also being uh, put into service. But the entirety of the series is narrated by the Archivist, one, a member of uh, Lady Kira's inner circle. But uh, Ochi is given his assignment as his Destic. It's in, it, Destic is informed that her, uh, her target and she's to bring a uh, girl named uh, Catalila, or Catalaya, who is the heir to two syndicates, to Kira. But Kira explains she, there, there are three types, when it comes to killers, there are, there are three reasons you will kill faith, hope, and joy. She explains some people will kill for the service, in the service of a greater power. Soldiers, idealists, fanatics, faith. Some people do it because they believe their life will be somehow improved by the death of another. Most who kill for money fit here, as do the Avengers, Revengers, and Power Seekers. Hope. And finally, there are those who simply like it. Joy. 
The examples shown are a Jedi for faith, Boba Fett for hope, and Vader for joy. But here says that both Ochi and Destic are unique. Their their past brought them to, brought them to killing in particular ways. Knowing their motivations allows Kira to properly motivate them, make sure they do what she wants them to. She explains that with Ochi, he kills because he's afraid. Everything he kills is something that can no longer kill him. He's seen monsters, terrifying things, and and knows there is no safe place for him. But uh, he got a uh, droid similar to the uh, droid utilized by um, Sam Wessel in the beginning of uh, Attack of the Clones. A difference being that this version, this later version, is uh, capable of cloaking itself. Uh, it turns out the Death Stick was... Uh, her entire lineage was wiped out during the Clone Wars, seemingly by General Grievous. She and her mother were, were two of the few who escaped. Since Almost since birth, she, was, she has carried the weight of that knowledge, that she was once part of something larger than herself and was taken away. She kills because she feels completely, utterly alone, and on some level, she wants other people to feel that way, too. Explaining it's the myth of pain, that sharing it somehow lessens it. All you really end up with is more hurt people. But, um, Kira gained Death Six loyalty by telling her a story. The story was the truth that Emperor Palpatine was behind the, the death of her people. He gave the order. And he, she and she also gave her made her a promise. If Death Six helped Kira, she would she could watch him fall. On Coruscant, um, Ochi is buying some poisons. Especially, he but he's looking for something that has extremely precise timing. Kind of like you give it to someone, you know down to the second when it'll when it'll land. But uh, he's given he's given some options and he decides to take all of them. While Destic is on the the planet Penicia, the Outer Rim, which seems to have a rather which has quite a bit of the Rebel fleet stationed on planet. But she finds uh, Ketalaya and uh, basically calls basically calls an Imperial information line and says, hey, I found a Rebel base on this one on planet Panicia. On Coruscant, um, Ochi Gets the poison to the uh, into the droid, tell, gives, him a, gives him his instructions, and sets himself up to watch. And he's watching, but he realizes that there's one one target missing. Turns out one of the Imperials that is missing decided to get an early start on work. But uh, on Panicia, the Empire shows up. Catalia is told to hide. Destic takes her back on Coruscant. Um, Ochi uses a, a slug thrower rifle, coats the slug in one of the poisons, and uh, grazes the neck of the missing officer. Turns out these Imperials are actually the Emperor's royal guard. And so the Emperor and Grand Vizier Ameda show up at the, at the throne room, and shortly after they arrive, all of the Emperor's guards collapse dead. Basically, the idea being that Oshi has been given a chance to. Um, Kind of show the emperor that you know your guards are are just are vulnerable, so are you. But uh, Destic brings Kitalia back to the Vermilion, and Kira introduces herself and says that the two that her and Kitalia are going to become good are going to be good friends, and that is where the issue ends. 
Crimson Rain has been really interesting so far. I, I'm, I'm really digging it. Um, it'll be interesting to see how the whole story plays out. It'll be, it'll be really neat once the, once the Crimson Dawn storyline is told in the Star Wars comics, see how, you know, to be able to look at, you know, points and say, ah, so this is why this happened. Okay, all right. Anyway, moving on to our final book for the moment, we've got Alien, number nine. Where we left off, um, a spinner colony on uh, the settlement moon Eurydice had just had a, uh, had a, had a ship, a supply ship crash into it, which appeared to be filled with xenomorphs. The xenomorphs have since gotten loose and have been making their and have been uh, attacking the colonists. One of the colony leaders, Jane, discovered that another uh, important member of the colony, Ambrose, was in fact an android. And so he restrains her in the hopes of uh, making her well a host. When one of the others, one of the other members of the community, comes in and basically smacks him in the head with a lead pipe, Jane takes out the face hugger that the face hugger get, uh, gets off of Jane, and uh, she blasts with a shotgun. But uh, Leo is told by Jane that Ambrose was behind this and. And he's, he explained that he used to build things like like Ambrose. So he's going to go through Ambrose's head and see what he can find out. Uh, they're trying to get... The people... The, town, the colonists are trying to get to their church. But, uh, you know, it's kind of a case of... Maybe one might come up... Some might be running and running some xenomorphs. Only for another one to pop up. Another colonist to pop up. You know, do what they can to take down the xenomorphs. But... Yeah. Everyone gathers in the church. Jane as and Am Ambrose explains what's happened as Leo has modified what's left of Ambrose in such a manner so that he can he cannot lie. And he there's a nice little uh, nod to uh, the speech Ian Holmes' decapitated head gives in uh, Alien, referring to the xenomorph as the perfect organism. But uh, Ambrose explains that. Um, but it, it's explained that <clears throat> because of the mine found on the planet uh, or on the moon, it looked like the spinners would be less reliant on the well, Utani, and the company found that objectionable. When it was clear that Eurydice would be successful, a Wailing Utani agent planned a bio weapon. On the UAR Heracles, the xenomorph. It's explained that uh, with enough force, they might kill one full grown xenomorph, perhaps even several, but in the end, they are, by their very nature, unstoppable. Too strong, too vicious, they reproduce and grow too quickly. The most versatile living thing in existence, the perfect organism, the ultimate survivor. No matter what you do, all of, no matter what they do, all of them will die. But so, so, Jane says the best thing to do is then to leave, get out, try and get off planet. However, some of the spinners want, wish to stay, and in the church they pray. And then the xenomorphs get make it into the church. While Jane, those who, are, who plan to leave, cut the bri cut the rope bridge that would connect that would allow those in the church to escape. Though to be fair, they, yeah. Escape is not an option for them anymore. However, the xenomorphs are coming. And Ambrose's head um, tells Janet her disease is spreading rapidly. She's feeling her face and extremities. It's all that she can do to put one foot in front of the other. And even without the aliens, how long does Jane think she, think she has? has? How, do, how does she expect to save to save the settlers, the spinners, 
from the perfect organism. And that is where the issue ends. So, Whaler Yutani finally got their bioweapon. I kind of, I'm not entirely surprised at that coming. Uh, it's. I wish there had been some more connective tissue between this story and the previous story, but maybe that's coming down the road, kind of a, you know, do a handful of six-issue stories that seem to not be connected and then have a sort of like, oh, here's, all connect here's how it's all connected. We'll see, though. Anyway, as always, feel free to like, share, and subscribe. Links to my Facebook, Twitter, Patreon, and PayPal can be found in the description box down below. This is Rock and Roll Spock signing off saying live long and rock hard.